last year when most investors were watching their stocks plummet. One Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage. He was identifying winning stocks with massive uptrends, like Riot Blockchain before it shot up 10,000%, Digital Turbine before it shot up 789%, Overstock.com before it shot up 1,000%. This power gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. Right now, you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works. A way to type in any of the 4,000 different tickers and see exactly where the stock is most likely to go next in any type of market. Simply go to chakentrial.com for your free look. Again, that's chakentrial.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is Thursday, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, as they call it around the world. 2022. And boy, I, I wish I had a bigger smile on my face than I do now. We had such a rally yesterday after the Fed came out. I did a little quick uh, short video for everybody, put it on Twitter, put it on YouTube. I'm gonna talk about what the Fed did, dive into a little bit more. But today, giving back basically all those gains of yesterday. Why is this happening? What's going on? Why is the market so crazy? We'll talk about all that coming up and why people continue to be so darn bearish. And when is it gonna switch? Right now, on Making Money. Again, welcome. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, 2022. It is a beautiful Thursday down here in South Florida. And boy, I got to tell you, uh, yesterday I did a short video for you all uh, talking about the Fed coming out. The first time they raised interest rates, uh, 50 basis points or higher since 2022 years, two darn decades. And stocks rallied on that. And, and, and I talked about how that was basically the opposite of buy the rumor, sell the news, meaning that a lot of that was already priced into the market. So the market priced in what we thought was going to be potentially a 75 basis point cut. It was only 50 or a hike, sorry, a hike 50. It was only 50. So that was a bit of a relief rally. But the key to yesterday's rally was one comment from Fed Chairman Powell. What he said was that a 75 basis point hike is off the table. Off the table for now. And there's a lot of people out there in the markets and a lot of the big firms predicting that we would have a 75 basis point, 0.75% rate hike in June and potentially more throughout the year. Now the way it's looking is we probably not 50 basis points. I don't think it's guaranteed at this point unless something dramatically happens in the economy and the world and the market before the June meeting, which isn't too far away. And that was that relief rally. People saying they're not going to be overly aggressive. They're aggressive. We knew that, but not overly aggressive. But the rally didn't continue. This morning, and I'm going to pull up the chart right now, the S&P 500 here in a second. This morning, we opened lower. And the sellings continued. Let's take a look here at the, at the SPYs, the SPY. As you can see, we're down about 2.7%. And if you, if you kind of zoom in here, I'll see if I can zoom in a little bit. The, the action in the last few days, we're basically a, a little bit net net from yesterday to today. So we gave back nearly all of yesterday's gains. Yesterday, we closed at a one-week high. Gave back almost everything. Same thing if I take a look at the NASDAQ, the Qs, the NASDAQ 100 gave back actually all of it. We're actually down. They gave back even more than yesterday's rally when it came to that. And the ARK Innovation Fund, ARKK, very similar. Gave back more than what we gained yesterday. Even though it was a huge rally yesterday, ARKK is down 7% right now. That's some wild swings, folks. I mean, it really is. And it's tough to kind of swallow that because, you know, as, as bullish as I was yesterday, it's no different today for me because I'm a long-term investor. I watched a lot of different television shows last night uh, based on, on the Fed, and I don't typically watch TV that much, but I watch CNBC, I watch Bloomberg, I watch a few others, and just kind of get their take. I, sometimes I like to see the take of the other people in the media. And it, it was definitely torn. Uh, it was one way or the other. See people saying, well, listen, this, this is the, the Fed telling us what they're going to do for the rest of the year, so let's price it into stocks. And then let's go from there. And that, that's kind of my camp right now. The other side is, this is a relief rally. We're going to give it all back quickly. They were right because they, we gave it back quickly. We gave it back in less than 24 hours. 
So there's something going on in the market right now that there's this uncertainty and nobody really can figure out what the heck is next. Or are we going to get inflation under control? Is the Fed really going to do what they say and basically say 50 basis points in the next couple of meetings? Are we going to see the war in Ukraine escalate, expand, or kind of just become numb to it as we have uh, recently? So much out there, questions. And I want to tell a story. I, I went out and had dinner last night, and um, I was sitting at the bar having my dinner. I had uh, some oysters, Rockefeller, and a steak. Sitting there enjoying a glass of wine, and uh, I hearing people talk. And I was fascinated by what I was hearing. There was a group of younger people, probably 30s or so, and I, I overheard them asking for some type of tequila drink. And the bartender said, well, what type of tequila would you like? And this was a decent place. And typically you, you say brand name. And the woman said, whatever's cheapest. There was another group of people to the left of me that I overheard speaking as well. And they were talking about just how bad things were. They were talking about an Uber. How much Uber costs? Who's going to pay for it to get home? And these people were, they, they were fairly well off. And I, I'm thinking to myself, is that how people perceive the economy right now? Is that how people perceive the world right now? Is everything worried about money? It had me thinking there and thinking a lot as I came home and laid in bed. And, and, and I'm trying to figure out what that means for the economy, what that means for the market. Granted, both the groups of people that I just referenced, I would say they're millennials, uh, probably in their 30s. But is, is, is money that big of an issue? Because you, you hear um, uh, Powell yesterday talk about, you know, jobs and, and how good the job situation is. You see there's 15 million job openings. Wages keep going up. But then you hear people saying, I'm underpaid. I can't get a job. Or maybe it's a job they don't want. So I have to tell you, I, I, I'm going to take this weekend and really think about this and, and what this means for the economy. Because what it means for the economy is going to be very important for how I invest in stocks. Does this mean that you, the, the, the consumer here in the U.S. is slowing down? They're still out drinking and, and, and eating dinner. But does this mean that they're, they're, they're tightening it? Does this mean that they don't have a lot of savings? Um, does it mean that they don't have the job they want? Are they unemployed? And just, there's a lot of things I need to think about because that is going to relate to what sectors in the near term uh, will do well and how the market itself does well. Because there's this perception that things are much worse, I think, than they really are. I, I, I get that. You know, a lot of businesses that did very well during uh, the pandemic, during the shutdown, have slowed down a little bit. And that's normal. There's a lot of businesses that were shut down during the pandemic. You know, you all know I used to own a, a fitness facility. Booming right now. That are doing very well right now. Reopening continues. So you're seeing a bit of a switch, but but again, the, the, maybe I'm isolated into where I live, into who I speak to and what I do. I try not to be, but I feel as if things aren't that bad. The economy is not that bad. Um, I go to restaurants. I walk down the main strip here every day on the way to the gym and back. I go for a walk, go to the beach. They're always packed. I mean, there's, there's a wait to get into almost every restaurant. Granted, this is a bit of a touristy town, but there's a wait. You are seeing consumer demand. With that being said, uh, the AAII, the American Association of Individual, Individual Investors, do out, you know, I talk about this almost every week. They do their investor sentiment almost a week, uh, uh, weekly. I almost talk about it every week. And last week, we had 59.4% uh, bears, one of the highest ever. The only other time it's been that high, was in 2008, the great financial crisis, and in 2000, the tech bubble. And the bulls were at 16.4%. The rest was neutral. This week, we remained above 50 again, 52.9% for the bears. So still extremely elevated. On the flip side, the neutral kind of cut down and bulls actually jumped up to 26.9%. So what this tells me is there's still, for the most part, one of the most bearish readings that we've seen in the last two decades. That doesn't really surprise me where we're at right now. It's kind of what I'm feeling from everybody. But what does surprise me is that the bulls over the three prior weeks, they average about 17%. We jumped up to nearly 27%. So you're seeing the bulls really kind of, some people saying, okay, maybe there's some buying opportunities here as well. And again, this goes back to what I saw in the financial media yesterday. We were really torn. 
it's either extremely, not extremely bullish, but uh, optimistically bullish, kind of like me, where I think there's great um, opportunity out there right now, or extremely bearish saying we're going to go to the next Great Depression. There's, there's not a lot in the middle. Very similar to political views of most people, but and where I to the middle. And I told the middle on this as well because I said yesterday in my little quick um, update that I did up in the Fed, I think we, we could have more volatility and more downside in the near term. Longer term, looking out 12 months to five years, I think there's great, great, great buying opportunities. And I believe six to 12 months from now, we'll look back at some of these companies and say, wow, Look at the opportunity we had there. Look at the bargain that we had there. Probably won't see these prices again. That being said, folks, we could still pull back another 5 to 10% in the markets, meaning some stocks could pull back even more. So I still think there, there, there is some near-term uh, craziness up ahead. And another chart I want to show you here is the VIX. This is the CBOE Volatility Index. You see here in this chart, um, it, basically they say when the VIX is high, it's time to buy. This measures fear. The fear spiked up here a few times in, in the last uh, four months. And every time it does that, the market tends to bounce. So we did that uh, last week, or sorry, that was on Monday, and uh, pulled back big downturn yesterday because the fear subsided as market rally. And you can see today it's up 14% of VIX, back up to 29. So this shows right here, this up and down. This indicates to me, this is a lot of up and down in just a five month time frame. This indicates to me the level of uncertainty. This indicates to me that a lot of people don't know what the hell's going on. And it's taking a lot of people right now and either selling stocks or they're, or they're just sitting on the cash that they have and they're being very hesitant to buy. And I understand that. There's nothing wrong with that to be hesitant. I will say this though, if you have a big cash position, there's a lot of great companies out there right now. Again, I don't know if this is the bottom. I have no idea. There's a lot of great companies out there that you may want to start looking at to start building position. I, I think that that's a great way to really kind of tackle the markets here. Um, so again, you know, to, to me, it comes down to uncertainty and the market hates uncertainty. We'd rather know what's going to happen than this unknown. But I think yesterday was a bit of a, a roadmap that the Fed gave us, honestly. I, I think that we will kind of know what's going to be happening. And I think we're going to continue to see 50 base, base point rate hikes. The unknown now, I guess, is, is, is will inflation, will it, will it tame inflation? Um, will it do anything to hurt borrowing? Will it hurt companies that uh, have not a lot of cash on the balance sheet? There's a, there's a lot of kind of these unknowns out there right now. And, and, and to me, it's, that's what's driving this craziness that we're seeing in the market. And again, you know, we are giving back basically everything that we, that we had yesterday. Right now, I didn't buy yesterday. I was going to buy before, as I mentioned, I mentioned this yesterday, before the uh, decision came out. I didn't buy because of this. Because I, 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 the short-term volatility tells me maybe I don't want to be as aggressive. I'm already in the market, so I don't want to be as aggressive. If I'm not in the market, yeah, I'm buying this weakness today for sure to gain some exposure. Uh, but already in the market. Uh, so we're going to kind of leave it there with, with, with this topic because uh, it's something where we're all over the place. But I will say, take this weekend and kind of take a step back. Uh, think about where kind of you are with your portfolio, what you feel comfortable with. You know, I, I ran money for 17 years. I always told my clients, I said, if, if there's a stock or something that keeps you from sleeping at night, sell it. Because you don't want to get to the point where stocks uh, are are hurting, where, where it's like hurting your health. Uh, so that that's something where if it gets to that, then then you want to take a step back. Uh, wait till you feel more comfortable to get in the market. But I also feel like you, we, we need to get to the point where we know how to weather ups and downs. We know how to weather bear markets and recessions. Because I mentioned during the roaring 2020s, the next eight years, we're going to have probably a couple recessions a couple of bear markets, several corrections of 10% or more, I'm sure, and pull back. So you need to be able to get used to dealing with that. And this right now, I gotta tell you, this is a <laughs> this is a time where it, it's definitely, it's testing people. It's a test to see if you can make it through it. And it's not <clears throat> easy, I'll tell you that, but it is absolutely a test, folks. So I asked a couple of questions on Twitter and, um, 
about things. And a lot of it was, you know, what's going to happen in the next one to two years? Uh, what's going to happen with cryptos? Uh, you know, real estate, gold, where we're at the market right now. So a lot of stuff I just talked about. Um, but I will tell you that there's one area that I'm doing a lot of research on right now. And I want to share with you. And I've talked about it in the past. And I'll pull up a uh, ETF that tracks this. And that's the, the rare earth uh, minerals, uh, metals, materials, whatever you want to call them. I'm looking at this in a, in a way that over the last couple of weeks, I've been researching this area for many, many years. Uh, going all the way back to 2010, 2011, there was a huge spike in rare earth uh, mineral prices. Uh, China basically cut off Japan and prices went up through the roof. There was all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, they bounced again uh, when Trump was in office. We had a bit of that trade war that went on with China. They bounced then. Uh, they bounced back uh, this year. They sold off recently. But let me show you a chart here of REMX. This is the VanX, uh, VanX Vectors Rare and Strategic Metals ETF. You can see here this rallied to a high uh, in April and pulled back with the market. But what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing with, with this sector, and the more and more research I do, I, I read so much about it yesterday. And it, it just, it's, a, it's something that, you know, it, you wouldn't think that I'm going to talk about miners that much. But without rare earth minerals, in a situation that we're in right now with China basically dominating the market, we will not be able to move forward with the roaring 2020s. Electric vehicles, space travel, uh, anything technology battery related, anything that has magnets in it, all need rare earth minerals. <clears throat> and because China dominates the market, they could basically shut us off at any point. We, may, we really have zero refining, zero of rare earth minerals in this country right now. There's a company by the name of Linus out of Australia. I talked about them in the past. They got uh, tens of millions of dollars from the U.S. government to build a refining uh, facility in Texas. Uh, I'm going to try to actually go visit that. Uh, MP Materials, which I've talked about in, in the past, the largest um, and really the only real uh, miner of rare earth minerals uh, in out west in, in North America. Uh, so they're, they're getting some backing. They're doing well. But most of the, of the concentration is in uh, China. Almost all we're finding is either China and a little bit Malaysia. Australia has big rare earth minerals um, deposits. And what I found yesterday is that governments are starting to get concerned because, again, China's a bit of like the market right now. It's an unknown. UK announced that they're going to have their first rare earth uh, refining facility. Canada recently announced uh, more exploration of rare earth mineral mines. I just talked about the US. You're seeing countries around the world that are realizing the demand because the demand that comes just for batteries, folks. I've talked about batteries so many times. You can't have the battery capacity for electric vehicles without these rare earth minerals. So if I, I think about this, I'm like, okay, what, what is one way to play the Roaring 2020s? We know there's more electric vehicles. We know technology is not going to stop moving forward. How do we play this? A lot of ways to play it, but without rare earth minerals, there's nothing. The price spike that I saw in some of these uh, materials that I found yesterday, five, ten fold in a matter of two years in 2010 and 2011, I think we're on the precipice of that again. So I'm doing some deep, deep dives of research right now uh, with my team. And, and th this is something I share because I want to share what I do on a daily basis. I spent all day yesterday basically without looking at the Fed and doing the Fed and everything went on looking at rare earth minerals. And what I love about this is there's not a lot of publicly traded companies here in the U.S. A lot of them are based overseas. Uh, ones that are here in North America are smaller, which gives us opportunity. So the more research that myself and my team do, we will find that opportunity. So again, this goes back to education. I'm educating myself right now on this topic. Having fun. I'm having fun doing this. I'm learning so damn much about rare earth minerals and what it all means to the world. And number three, making money. That is the key. And once I build this portfolio, once I come up with it, it's going to take me weeks because I just you don't, you don't do something very quickly. If I'm investing or suggesting people to put money into it, it's going to take weeks of research, if not longer. I can't wait to release this portfolio. It is going to be amazing. It's, it's, it's going to be one of the core portfolios you need for the Roaring 2020s. So again, there's a couple of ETFs out there. I don't like the ETF route because there's too many stocks. I looked at all of them. There's three ETFs out there that kind of tackle this. Too many bad stocks in there. Uh, too many stocks that really don't make any sense. They're not Roaring Earth Minerals. 
so to me, I'll put the other basket for subscribers here coming up again. It's going to take probably weeks or a month or two to do it, but I really know that's what I'm working on this weekend. I'm going to spend a lot of time reading. I will become an expert on rare earth minerals uh, by the end of May. I will tell you that. So again, folks, I want to thank you so much. Um, I, I know today's a rough day. I know this week's been nuts. Uh, we still have the S&P down 3% right now, basically giving back everything that we gained yesterday. Uh, buckle up. It's going to be a, a couple of wild weeks, I think, going forward. Um, this volatility, I don't see any anytime soon. I think there's going to be some great opportunities in some individual stocks. And if you have the uh, um, strength to, the, <laughs> to do that, I'd be picking up some stocks right now. But in the meantime, uh, let's just stay strong, hold the portfolio, and uh, uh, we'll be back Tuesday. And, and, I, and I will say, I got to keep looking down at the charts right now. Uh, they are one of the wildest, craziest charts and it's in a short term time frame. I've seen a long time. And uh, I don't think the turbulence are ending anytime soon. But when you're on a plane, if those turbulence eventually come out and smooth sailing. And we will have that at some point in your future, folks. But more importantly, have a wonderful, safe, happy weekend. Uh, stay warm, stay cold, depending on where the hell you are. Uh, go out there, tell somebody hello. Smile, spread the love, because I'm telling you, after sitting there last night and dinner, I feel like people are a bit on edge. Let's think about life in reality um, and think about where we are. And the stock market will be here Monday. It's going to be here next Monday. Uh, money's going to be here. So let's go out there and be happy and spread that love. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for supporting. I'm Adam Paul, and that's making money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.